This is seminar number four of, of five that will comprise the 2022 season of seminars at Steamboat. And as you know, I'm Walt Dabbert, I'm the seminars chair. It's my great pleasure to extend greetings uh, to those of you who have been here many times and also to those of you who may be here for the first time. We are thrilled to have you with us as we take a deep dive into a very pressing local and national issue tonight. For two decades, Seminars has presented a plethora of insightful and forward-looking public policy presentations by distinguished experts. And we continue that tradition with tonight's lineup uh, that covers a part of the spectrum that includes uh, China, the political divide, cryptocurrency, next week the Supreme Court, and tonight uh, this evening's talk on the dysfunctional housing market and the challenge of affordable housing. Many people have made this uh, season a success, and I've said it before, and I'm, you're going to hear me say it again, it's you, our audience, and it's you, our sponsors, who have uh, kept seminars uh, vibrant with discussions on key current events. You make it possible for us to bring distinguished experts to the community, and you do it, we do it as a free community service. Thank you, and please keep us in mind when you are making your giving plans. Next week, the Seminars Board will already begin making plans for next year's program. And we'd like, <clears throat> we'd like to invite you to share your suggestions and ideas with us on topics for the 2023 season. Just send us a short, a short email, no later than this Friday, to all one word, seminars at Steamboat, at gmail.com. Special thanks go to tonight's program sponsor, Sleeping Giant Financial, and many thanks as well to tonight's supporting sponsors, Joel and Karen Biasic, and Tony and Emily Seaver. Let's give them a <laughs> I'd also like to remind you that you can view any seminars program by going to our website and clicking on past seminars. These videos are available about one week after the live presentation. It takes a little time for us to do the closed captioning. As in previous years, KUNC Community Radio of Northern Colorado is again making this season's audio talks available on the seminars podcast landing page at KUNC.org. Once our speaker has concluded his presentation, he will take your questions, which you can submit at any time by scanning the QR code on the back of your program. We think we took care of the glitch that occurred last time. Or by opening your smartphone's browser and entering www.joinqa.com and the entry code is 85518. Our speaker this evening is Christopher Tomei, and here to introduce him and to moderate the Q&A session following is Seminars Board member, Marianne Capra. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marianne Capra. And I'm a board member of Seminars at Steamboat, and I'm providing the introduction for our speaker tonight, Christopher Tomey. Housing needs in the US far outstrip livable and affordable units. This is seen in major cities and suburbs and places like Steamboat Springs across the country, which grapple with a range of problems from short term and chronic homelessness to where young people at the beginning of their careers and family, family life can afford to live. 
Here in Steamboat and other mountain communities, the struggle is how and where to house full and part-time workers. Recently, the New York Times featured a front page story about this focusing on Sun Valley, Idaho. How did this problem get so exacerbated? What are some successful examples of creative housing? And what about programs that didn't work and why? Here to walk us through this issue is an expert on our dysfunctional housing market. Christopher Tomey has spent years working on housing issues and is currently the executive director of the Urban Land Institute's Terwilliger Center for Housing. And I was just backstage with Christopher and he mentioned that, I asked him, how did you get your start in housing? And he laughed because at the age of 26, he decided he really wanted to live in Washington, D.C. And his mother's best friend had a position, a staffing position with a congressman in D.C. And uh, through that, he got hired as the bottom employee, mostly thing, dealing with things like the mail. Um, but then he got assigned within the first year to deal with all federal housing issues for the congressman, which he said was some reflection of how that congressman rated the importance of that topic. <laughs> but I know you know a lot about him. Those of you who are here tonight in person have the bio in front of you, so take a look at that. I just want to mention his career highlights also include leading government relations and advocacy, meaning he actually launched the national campaign for that, for Habitat for Humanity International. And Christopher also served is serving on the governing board of the National Housing Conference. Please welcome our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, and thank you, Mary Ann. It's great to be here, and uh, thanks to the board for extending the invitation. It's a real privilege and an honor to be here with you. This is one of my favorite places to be, and I haven't been here in about eight years, so I was absolutely thrilled to come back and see all the change uh, that has happened here. Uh, housing is one of my favorite things to talk about, so um, this was a fantastic opportunity to get to come and, uh, and chat about housing. I want to say just a word about the opening slide here, because in some ways it kind of encapsulates a lot of the housing problems we have. Uh, this is a, a graphic of missing middle housing. It was actually created by a guy named Dan Parallack with Out to Coast Design, who, if you didn't coin the term missing middle, he's the one who kind of popularized the term. But the scary thing about it is the reason that those typologies of housing are missing is because they're illegal to build almost everywhere in this country. You can't build those houses that fall between a single-family detached home and a mid-rise uh, apartment building. It's not legal in most places to do it. And you know what we need in order to meet the affordability and attainability and access challenges we have today? Those typologies, because we can get them into almost every neighborhood without affecting the architectural character in ways that can give people access to high-performing neighborhoods um, that they don't have right now. Um, and so in many ways, um, this reflects a lot of the discussion that we're going to have today um, about the housing challenges that we face. Just a quick word about the Terwilliger Center. Um, we are the housing content center within the Urban Land Institute. If you're not familiar with ULI, we are uh, the largest global uh, association of land use and real estate experts in the world. We have over 40,000 members globally. In terms of the housing content that the Terwilliger Center works on, it's all focused on the U.S. We deliver that in a number of different ways. We have a research program that we conduct. I'll talk about some of that research here today. We also have uh, an annual conference and that's gonna be in Dallas next year. We have a monthly webinar series and a newsletter and other ways that we deliver some of that content. But I think the most exciting work we're doing right now is going into cities and doing deep dives with municipalities and housing stakeholders about how they get to the base of the housing challenges that they're facing and putting forward real actionable recommendations on how to meet those. And so I'll close today's presentation with an example of how we're bringing experts together to do that work and to apply some of the concepts that we'll talk about. 
I want to say, uh, first, I just want to set the stage a little bit in terms of where we are with housing attainability, and we'll do that with our flagship research product that we produce at the Terwilliger Center, which is our annual home attainability uh, analysis. After we set the stage a little bit with where we are, I want to talk about a little bit about what got us there, but I want to spend most of our time talking about some of the solutions are, that are out there to address some of the myriad housing challenges that we're facing today. So I'll try to run through this stage setting piece um, relatively quickly. Uh, I think big picture what's important to understand, there's a lot of uncertainty out there and we're in a, in a period of change and uncertainty. We don't know exactly what's happening with the economy. We're definitely gonna see some changes in the development industry from what we've seen in recent years. But in spite of all of that that's going on right now, our housing challenges are rooted in what's happened in the last 10 to 15 years and it's under production and it's produced a mismatch between supply and demand that has driven attainability out of reach of more and more families. It's all across the country, no matter where you live geographically, and it's reaching higher and higher up the income scale. And it's not rooted in the economic uncertainty and the change that we see today. It's rooted in the underproduction that we've seen since the financial crisis and, uh, and the Great Recession. I think that uh, one of the things we're seeing, and I think the reason housing is becoming a higher profile issue right now, is because regional production shortfalls and housing attainability is causing businesses and households to leave cities and move other places. And um, it hasn't happened to this degree in the past, and I think that's one of the reasons you're hearing a lot of mayors and city council members that are talking about this issue. You're seeing a lot more about it in the papers because it's having overflow effects uh, and it really goes to the long-term ability of a city to thrive. I think uh, another point that's important that we looked at this year or that we observed this year is a lot of places where people are moving to didn't necessarily expect such an influx of new residents and don't necessarily have the plans and systems and, uh, and uh, 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 staffing and other capacity in place to address that and they're gonna need some help getting there. And then finally, our attainability index focuses primarily on moderate income, what's sometimes called workforce housing, but not so much on the uh, income restriction, restricted government subsidized housing, which tends to be 60% of median income or less. That's because that's not where most of our members are working. And so what we're really trying to do is help that market rate housing reach to a deeper income level. And so our attainability index reflects that and focuses a lot on more moderate income levels, but we can never put our report out without mentioning this last bullet, which is there's nowhere in the country that is providing enough housing for people at the lowest income levels. Nowhere. Sometimes it's more of a housing problem, sometimes it's more of an income problem, but it doesn't matter where you are. We are not providing sufficient public subsidy to make the numbers work to develop those units and put them on the ground and preserve the affordability of units that exist today. And that is something that's gonna to have to be addressed. Uh, one of the things I want to do today is also introduce you to some of the partners and other organizations that we work with at the Terwilliger Center that I think can be a great resource to you if you want to look further into some of the housing challenges and solutions we'll talk about. One of them is the National Housing Conference. They mentioned that I serve on the, the conference's board, and we leverage their Paycheck to Paycheck database, which really helps us in our attainability index put a face on the housing challenge. So it looks at many, many occupations and what people in those occupations can afford in a particular housing market. And it looks across both uh, rental housing and owned housing. And so um, big picture, what it's telling us right now, I think you would expect the yellow graph, the first one there is looking at the rise in home prices that in, uh, over, the last, uh, over the last couple of years, actually that goes back a number of years, but the big increase is happening uh, just over the last five years. If you look at the typical rental price, you see a similar kind of increase. And in the last graphic there, the blue line are wage increases, and you see that there have been steady wage increases along the way, but they're nowhere close to keeping up with the increases in the price of housing and with the rents. And that means housing is taking bigger and bigger chunks out of people's budgets, and it's at the same time we have a lot of inflation happening in a lot of areas of people, people's lives. And so we're gonna see a lot more people finding it hard just to stay under a roof um, with these challenges that are, that are being faced. 
And this is, kind of, this is how we break it down in the index. It's a little hard to read, and I apologize, but I think the red and the green will help give you a sense on what a difficult situation we have. This is not a representative group of uh, occupations, it, it, but it's ones that we thought were all critical. You need these occupations no matter where you live. So it includes everything from mechanics to bus drivers, child care workers, um, tractor trailer drivers, laborers, um, nursing assistants and registered nurses, uh, middle school teachers, just a selection of those with incomes ranging from 20000 up to 83000 And those first three listed, there are actually two income households because we wanted to look at what attainability meant for them as well. And as you go across, the first two white columns are focused on ownership um, with 10% down and 3% down. Good luck finding um, those terms anywhere today. And then the next uh, three columns are looking at rental affordability, fair market rent for a one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom uh, uh, apartment. And what you can see is it's covered with red. What red means is that in fewer than 50% of the markets that we looked at in our attainability index, can these occupations afford that housing option? There are six occupations on this list that cannot afford any of these options in 90% of the 112 markets that we looked at in the Home Attainability Index. That is a significant problem. These are people that we need in our towns, that we need in our cities, that we need for our businesses to thrive, and if we don't start finding ways to produce that housing, our cities are going to fail. Another uh, partner who works with us and provides some of the data for our analysis is the National Low Income Housing Coalition. They focus more on the lower end of the market, and I do want to drive home uh, the point uh, that there is extreme need at that end. They look specifically at what, uh, at what it takes for an average minimum wage worker to afford an, a, a, an average, uh, a modest one bedroom apartment at fair market rents. You have to work 79 hours a week if you're an average minimum wage worker, two full-time jobs to afford a one bedroom apartment at a fair market rent. This is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for households and families, and it's not sustainable for our cities. They also put a face on it. They do it a little bit different way. So they look at a housing wage. So what does the hourly wage look like rather than looking at the annual income? And they identified $21 and a quarter as the housing wage for a one bedroom apartment and then show all of the occupations whose income levels fall below that. It, it includes a lot that you saw on the last list, financial clerks, administrative workers, material uh, moving workers, building cleaning and pest control workers, retail sales workers, food and beverage, beverage workers. Retail sales workers and food and beverage workers are at $13 and $14 an hour, and it's 21 and a quarter an hour for a one-bedroom apartment. How do people make ends meet? This is a great report that comes out annually. It's put out by the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. It's called The State of the Nation's Housing. And if you want to really understand the context and what's happened in the last year, this is a report that delivers every single year. They see the situation that we have as unsustainable. Um, they really see the housing market as being at, at an inflection point. They focused a lot in uh, this year's report on those soaring costs. Uh, they really want to drive home the point that while that yellow line that's looking at home prices uh, is a little bit higher than the rental price line, the real attainability we, we have is among renters. The attainability crisis that we have right now is among renters. Throughout the 20 teens, we had about half renter households that were cost burdened, so that were paying more than a third of their income on housing. And you're seeing numbers for black uh, uh, households uh, at five, six percent higher. Um, rates of cost burden than you're seeing white, white uh, households, and that's all been exacerbated throughout the pandemic. It's still a rental-focused crisis, but we're seeing those price run-ups on, on both the rental and ownership side. They also make the point that this is not a geographically restricted problem. They looked at the top 150 markets in the U.S., and they all increased rents over one year from 21 to 22, first quarter 21 to 22, um, by at least 1 percent, and those are the ones uh, between 1 and 5 percent of the dark blue. Uh, the 5 to 10 percent are the lighter blue color, and then you see a lot of that map is covered with more than 10 percent rent increases over that one year period. 10 to 20 percent is the yellow, and those that uh, are orange uh, increased at over 20 percent. One market was actually up to 542 percent over that uh, first quarter uh, of 21 to 22. Why is this happening? Under production. 
There's a great organization called Up for Growth that put out a housing on, uh, under production report in July that updated some previous work that they've done. And they noted specifically the, the problems that this under production is causing with access to housing, attainability, and equity. And this is also a report that the Terwilliger Center contributed to talking about the Boise project that we'll mention in a little bit. Looking nationwide, they estimate that we have a housing deficit of about 3.8 million units as of 2019. This is up from a 1.65 million unit deficit in 2012, and it's, it's pretty simple. It's not as simple as I'm going to make it. But overall, what they're really looking at are the number of households and the household growth in a location versus the number of units and building in a, a target vacancy rate of around 5% and then seeing what that deficit looks like. And uh, 3.8 million units nationally is a huge deficit for us to try to overcome, especially when we still have household growth um, that's moving forward. The number of cities that are facing this problem in a severe way increased from 12 to 169 in 2019, so the problem is, uh, is expanding. It's not getting better. There were some questions about what is the relationship between supply and production and cost at the end of the day that were being raised pre-pandemic. I think after the last couple of years, it's harder to raise some of those questions. You can't deny the run-up in home prices as people have tried to move into home ownership in different locations. You can't deny the run-up in rental as we've seen vacancy rates at historic lows. So it's a little bit harder to make that argument, but for anyone who's not yet convinced that there's a connection between supply and demand in housing and that production has an impact, the Furman Center at NYU took a specific look at this and they took the critiques very seriously and looked at all of kind of the available studies and information out there, the preponderance of the evidence shows a direct connection. That when you restrict the production and supply of housing, you have higher housing costs. When you enable it, you have lower cost and more affordability. The other side, of course, is the household hold growth side that is creating the demand that you need to supply. And about five years ago, the Joint Center for Housing Studies estimated there was going to be about a, a 12 million uh, additional households between 2018 and 2028. That is such an underestimate that they're not even saying how much that they're projecting right now. They just said in the most recent State of the Nation's housing report that this was a substantial underestimate. And, uh, and I think the most important thing to recognize, though, is this doesn't mean that we have less household growth in, in front of us. We still have a major portion of the millennial cohort who are entering in to the peak um, childbearing and household formation years. And this is something we looked at in a in our family renter report that we released at the Terwilliger Center a couple of years back. And the kind of light gray that you see is, uh, is in 2030. And at that point, the, the largest kind of segment of our population will be millennials at the peak of their childbearing and household formation age, which is that uh, black line that's on the graph. And so we have at least 10 years of strong household growth in front of us after 15 years of not keeping up with the household growth that's occurred. We have a lot of work to do. And why aren't we doing it? We know about this, and it's been happening in a lot of places, and, what, and what's driving this? A lot of it has to do with costs, and this is something we've been looking at at the Terwilliger Center for a number of years. This is actually a report that uh, focused specifically on affordable housing that we did a decade ago looking for opportunities to, uh, to cut costs so that you could create more units with the understanding that there's always a limit to the public subsidy that's going to be available, and there's so much, again, in the low-income population who need uh, housing that they can afford. So we've been looking at this for a while. Um, it's pretty clear what the cost drivers are. 50 to 70 percent of, of the cost of uh, new housing development is, is wrapped up in hard costs. So you're looking at labor, materials, subcontracting, areas that frankly are very, very difficult to affect and particularly difficult over the short term. Another 20 to 30 percent are in your soft costs. So that's some of your public fees, impact fees that you pay, it's uh, carrying costs, taxes that you pay when you're holding or developing on the land, it's your developer fee, it's your architectural engineer, engineering, other kind of professional fees that are part of that. Some of that maybe you can streamline and reduce, but the, the opportunities for savings are pretty marginal. And then you have land costs that run 10 to 20 percent of the project, and you do have some uh, uh, policy levers you can use to affect that. But you really have to focus on the soft costs and on the land costs because uh, the building and labor costs are, are out of sight right now, and, and the, the ways to go about solving those issues are, are very long term. 
Um, this is the Joint Center's uh, uh, look at some of the key uh, materials, building materials that we've seen a run up in prices on in recent years. The red is February of 2020, yellow is 21, and blue is February 22. So you see everything continuing to increase pretty uh, substantially, other than we had a little bit of pullback in the lumber and wood products. We'll see where the negotiations with Canada go with that. But um, again, this is something that developers have very little control over, policymakers and planners have very little control over. The labor piece of it is the same way. This is a, these are projections from the Associated Builders and Contractors. And earlier this year, they projected, the green line here is construction spending, the orange line is construction employment, and they already projected, just for projects in the pipeline, they projected a need for 650,000 new construction workers in 2022, and another 590,000 next year. And we need more housing projects in the pipeline. Where are those workers going to come from, and how much is it going to cost to pay for them? Um, I think there's a lot of workforce development that's happening, but it's going to be a long-term proposition getting them in, and the, these costs are going to be something that are going to be tough to control for some time. So that leaves us with land and with soft costs, and it leaves us primarily with policy tools to impact those, and we'll talk about those in a minute. On the land side, you want to increase the land available for uh, development, you want to increase the ability to densify on that land at the correct locations, and you want to expand and increase subsidies so you can deliver some lower cost units. On the soft cost side, again, you have professional services that maybe you can get some marginal savings in, and, um, uh, and then you have policy options to reduce p uh, fees, taxes, some of the permitting costs, and providing lower cost financing. And I don't want to leave the uh, laying out the problem without getting to Merriam-Webster's second definition of dis dysfunctional, which is characterized by unhealthy interpersonal behavior or interaction. And you can't minimize the effect this has on housing development. And it comes in the form of nimbyism and localism. And let me say, first of all, that public engagement and input is vital to the success of any development project. And it must be taken incredibly seriously, not just giving the opportunity for people to say their piece, but reflecting that in your plans, listening on an ongoing basis, adjusting to what it is that's wanted. But not every argument against a development is well taken. Not every demar argument against a development is well founded. And, um, and while not every development should happen, and certainly everyone shouldn't happen in a way that's, uh, uh, that it's immediately proposed. The need that we have for housing in this country today um, requires us to find pathways around that opposition. At a certain point, you have to find common ground, and we have to meet those very desperate housing needs that we're facing. You hear legitimate concerns, and I'm not dismissing any of these. I think in a lot of locations, they end up being unfounded, there are serious concerns, but we're not being serious with ourselves if we don't admit that those, can all, those concerns can also be used to mask things that are rooted in racism and classism and an intent to exclude, and we have to get past it. It's the only way that we address attainability and affordability, and it's certainly the only way that we address the equity problems we've created in this country. So what are the solutions? What do those look like? I want to focus primarily on the cost side, because I think that that's kind of what we can most immediately affect. There was a great paper that the Urban Institute put out last year that kind of prioritized what it thought in the current environment would be some of the best areas to focus on. Land, it saw, is the greatest opportunity. The second was on finance, particularly for affordable, kind of capital A affordable, income-restricted housing, and they look primarily at the federal level, and then looking at, uh, at uh, long-term solutions for the labor and materials costs, and that includes uh, things like technology and manufacturing. Um, solutions that have an enormous amount of potential to reduce costs in both of those areas, but are probably um, a long time away from being able to reach the scale and replicability that we need to actually have a kind of national impact on access, attainability, and equity. The first thing we have to do is legalize it. All those housing forms that we saw on that first slide that you can't build in most neighborhoods are something that we absolutely need to have because you only solve this problem when everyone is taking part in the solution. Every neighborhood, no one's excluded, 
no one's exclusive. It doesn't mean we go in and change the, change the character of neighborhoods. There's lots of good things that we need to preserve, but a lot of those neighborhoods were built on investments that a lot of people didn't have access to. Shouldn't they have access to those neighborhoods right now? I think so. So let's legalize it first. Y'all legalize more difficult things than, than housing in Colorado, and I've made my obligatory cannabis joke, and we'll move on. Uh, and just to drive home again the point on equity, uh, do take a look at this Up for Growth report if you want a very quick kind of summary of the, of the policies and uh, processes and practices that got us in the, in the state from an equity perspective where we are today. It's about discriminatory government grants that only went to white households. It's about exclusionary zoning policies. It's about deed restrictions that, uh, that, uh, that were racially keyed. It's about redlining practices that happen not just in government, but in business, in the insurance industry. It's about urban renewal projects that destroyed some of the healthiest black communities that have been built up since the Civil War in this country. These are the things that we have to remember when we're fighting the battles to get these projects built. We cannot forget that black and brown people are disproportionately represented in the lower income folks who have the hardest time finding housing in this country, no matter where, where you are, and they have almost no access to those neighborhoods that were built on investments that they never, their families and predecessors never had access to. Back in July of 2019, the city of Washington brought ULI in to have a, a study panel, a five-day, what we call advisory services panel, where experts are brought in from around the country. I was, had the ability to participate as a panelist in this one. They specifically asked us to come in, come in and tell the mayor how to build out a piece of her housing plan. Now, her housing plan was to add 36,000 housing units throughout the city of Washington, D.C., and that included 2,400 units in the Rock Creek West Planning District. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Washington, D.C., Rock Creek West Planning District is west of Rock Creek Park. It is the most expensive, exclusive, predominantly single-family zoned area in Washington, D.C. And she said, I don't know how we're going to get these units in here. You guys come in here and figure this out for us. <laughs> and uh, it, they ask for bold solutions, and I think the panel came forward with some, and we've seen them, actually a lot of these we've seen incorporated into the mayor's plan, into their implementation plans and efforts that have happened since then. But I think this is a good example of how cities need to be thinking about this problem. You gotta end the exclusive zoning. You gotta legalize housing, first of all. You gotta support accessory apartments or accessory, accessory dwelling units, which you can put in single family neighborhoods without altering the architectural look and feel of that neighborhood at all. Um, it can be done and you have to do it because everybody has to be part of the solution. You can add general density in other locations. In this area of Washington, D.C., they have aging um, retail corridors with really old strip malls in there. They look terrible from the street. You can go in there, redevelop some of those, put uh, uh, more modern retail on the lower floor, have uh, housing units upstairs and behind them. It doesn't change the nature, the character of those single-family neighborhoods that are behind those commercial centers at all. You're just adding housing for people who didn't have access to it before in a well-performing, high-performing neighborhood. You gotta streamline the development process. It can take years to get a project approved and on the ground in DC, and it makes it very, very hard to deliver units at, uh, at a low cost. Parking requirements, terrible. In, in Washington, DC, if you're building a mid-rise or a high-rise building, you have to do that underground. It adds over $100,000 a unit. Try to deliver a unit that you can rent at an affordable rate if you have to pay $100,000 to build a parking place. You have to have marketing and education campaigns. Everyone is not going to be brought along. Everyone is not going to be convinced that our, uh, our inequitable past means we need to have a more equitable future. But you have to at least give people the opportunity to come along and put the information in their hands and see what happens. In Minnesota, when they got rid of single family zoning, they convinced a heck of a lot of people who said they would never be for that to be in favor of eliminating single-family single zoning in the, in the city of Minneapolis, and, and that happened. It took a long time and a lot of engagement, but it happened, and people will come along. Not everybody, but a lot of people will come along, and you have to talk specifically about our history of race and class. You can't ignore it. You can't pretend it's not there. You have to talk about it, and you have to talk about how you address it moving forward. It's not to point fingers about what happened in the past. It's to make sure that we're bearing that in mind as we plan for the future. 
The second piece they talk a lot about are, are financing costs, and again, this is particularly focused at the affordable income restricted end, so typically um, these are units for families earning 60% of the, an area's median income or less, and these are some of the uh, federal programs that enable that. The Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program is the largest federal production program specifically for affordable, capital A affordable housing. But a lot of these are being replicated at the state level and some at the local level. We have state housing trust funds. Some of those focus at higher income levels, not just the low income and very low income, but getting into some of that uh, middle section of local workforces where, where some of those uh, occupations we were looking at before are. And, um, uh, and some states are creating housing tax credit programs at the state level as well. And you even see some local housing trust funds. The city of DC, I think, put $16 million into their local housing trust fund this year. Um, and they look at a variety of income levels, not just the lowest income level. So providing financing tools that can, again, help reduce the overall cost of the project can be a very important piece of this, particularly when you're trying to reach those, uh, those lower income levels. And then you have to incentivize and subsidize. Jenny Schutz from the Brookings Institution released a great book called Fixer Upper. I would commend it to your attention. More broadly, she's talked about kind of a three-legged stool in her approach to dealing with this problem. And she thinks a lot about um, both the public and private systems that can contribute to the solution. Density is the first leg of the stool, adding smaller, um, denser, lower cost housing in the places where people actually want to live and where they have, it says want to love there, it's want to live, and uh, um, where, they, where they actually want to live and where the neighborhoods are high performing, that's why they want to live there, right? It has access to jobs and services and retail and the other things they want. Land value tax is a piece of what she talks about that I think is very interesting. It's an alternative to um, uh, more traditional property taxes in some places that would penalize, whoops, you're taking a vacant piece of property and putting an apartment building on it or uh, redeveloping a parking lot into uh, apartments. If you tax the value of the land, you don't have the same kind of increase if you're, if, as if you're taxing the sticks and bricks on top of the land. That can be a way of at least getting a, uh, rid of a disincentive for putting more units on the ground. You can also design it in a way that you actually create an incentive for lower cost units. And then finally, uh, she advocates for creating direct subsidies for the households who need this. This is so often an income problem. So let's get enough units on the ground so that the market will provide things at a rate that's reasonable, and then the households who really need it, let's give them the funding that they need so that they can access that housing. That's her three-legged stool. It's a good lens, a good approach. And then finally, I want to go back to, to Up for Growth because they have a framework that incorporates a lot of these ideas that I think is worth, worth looking at. And again, it's all about prioritizing development and density in the highest performing areas and the places people want to be, where the services are, where the transit nodes are, where uh, other investments are being made. And you get a whole range of benefits from that. It's not just access and attainability, it's equity, uh, racial equity. It is, um, uh, it is climate resilience and doing much better by the environment. People think that when you add density, you add traffic. You add traffic when you make people live way out of town and drive back and forth. That's how you add traffic, that's how you add pollution. Put some, put, uh, let people locate centrally in a place they can afford and where they don't have to get behind the wheel of the car. You're gonna have a better environmental impact of your housing and you're gonna have a more, uh, a more, more resilient um, climate stock and a more resilient, uh, climate resilient city. And finally, about the NIMBYism and localism. There are a few ideas out there about how to address this. We released a report, the Yes in My Back report, Yard report a few years ago that looked at specifically kind of state and local government policies that could address it. Um, one, states just need to think about how to empower and incentivize local governments to, uh, to get these units built. They're trying an experiment in this in California right now. I don't know if local governments feeling more empowered or incentivized or beaten up there in trying to figure this out right now, but they're definitely creating, the state government is creating an incentive for local government to start meeting, meeting this need, and I think it's a good thing. I think we're probably gonna have to shake out how that policy best works, but it's a good thing for state government to think about. Uh, always looking at ways to reduce regulatory costs and incentivize local government to do that is uh, a way to help more projects become viable and deliver units at a lower cost and create alternative paths to overcome unreasonable neighborhood opposition. They did this in Massachusetts with 40B so that when a, when a town wants to move forward, serve a lower income population, they've really done everything they can to mitigate the concerns that have been raised and the arguments that are being raised 
uh, really are unfounded, there is a tool that you can use in, in Massachusetts to get around that and get some units in the ground. And that's something that I think some other states are probably going to have to consider at the end of the day. And then Jenny Schutz makes a couple of uh, other uh, suggestions in uh, Fixer Upper. One is there are a lot of good faith actors, particularly among those smaller cities who didn't know they were going to have this huge housing need that they're facing now and may not have the capacity to do it, uh, uh, to, to plan and execute what they need to. Um, and they may have some, some incorrect views about what's needed to make that development happen. We shouldn't assume everybody's a bad actor. A lot of these uh, places just need the right information in their hands. So we should make an effort to get that information in locations that are struggling to meet need that is, that is kind of newly, uh, been newly recognized. And then thinking about incentivizing regional cooperation. This is really important because you can get into a regional race to the bottom where every jurisdiction is trying to force the lower income housing and the lower income residents into the next jurisdiction over. If you connect some of the development dollars that the government provides to regional planning activities, then maybe that you can get a more coordinated effort, some regional commitments, and uh, not that race to the bottom that we've seen in so many locations. So finally, I want to talk about how all uh, many of these concepts and solutions are brought together to uh, put some real recommendations forward for a city. And this is when we bring these study panels. I mentioned the, the Washington DC study panel uh, earlier. That was a week long study panel. This is a two and a half day study panel that we did in Boise uh, back in May. You may have read that Boise has had an enormous influx of residents over the particularly the last five years. 10 years ago, it was one of the most affordable places to live from a housing affordability standpoint. Today, it's one of the least affordable places in the US to live from a, a housing affordability standpoint. And um, so they really wanted to work with ULI Idaho and with the Terwilliger Center to uh, build on some planning that they had already done. They had already created a great foundation, building out a local plan, identifying what their housing deficit was, the number of units they need. But then they really wanted some help figuring out where do these units go, how do we get them done, um, how do we design them in a way that, um, that aligns with what our community values are today, but that's also planning to meet the needs that we're going to have in this city in the future. Very, very, uh, very, very interesting project. And again, it brings together a lot of the ideas we've talked about. This is what our panelists said, ultimately, it boiled down to, is do you want to leave it to chance, Boise, or do you want to make choices about what your city's going to be? Because people are coming here, and people are making housing choices. And people who've lived here for decades aren't able to afford their rental housing in Boise and are having to move out of Boise. Um, and businesses are having to hire people from a long way away to drive long distances in and out of Boise. Um, do we want, do, do you want that kind of development to happen or do you want to plan a way that better aligns with the values? These are the values that they identified. I think you probably share some of these with Boise. Um, uh, they want to grow in a sustainable and efficient way, not the kind of out of control, they really felt like they were experiencing out of control growth in 2016 when the Blueprint Boise came out. They want to maximize constrained land. There's a lot of land there, but not much of it's available for development. So how do you use the land that's available as effectively as you can to meet your housing needs? Carbon neutrality and climate resilience, very, very important to them. How do we build the housing that we need at scale and also maintain our commitment to climate resilience and, um, and uh, environmental responsibility? And, and finally, it was about transportation. How do we make transportation investments and create a modern transportation system um, that also expands safe pathways for bicyclists and for, for walkers um, and make that investment in a way that's not only works for the city today, but that's sustainable over time. The, I, the consequences of not doing anything they decided were unacceptable, sprawl, uh, greater impact on the environment, all these people behind the wheels of the car driving to and from Boise for their jobs, um, decreased resilience to climate change, social inequities, stymied economic development is a big concern. We interviewed some people from the hospital there who said that they were having trouble recruiting doctors to Boise because it was too expensive for doctors to find housing in Boise. Um, uh, clearly a problem. If it's a, if it's a problem for the hospital, you can bet a lot of the other businesses in town are having problems hiring the people that they need, and a decreased quality of life is the ultimate outcome for everyone. I mentioned that they had a housing plan they had created, and this is kind of the graphic 
representation. They broke it down in terms of income levels, in terms of numbers of units they needed over a period of time, over their guiding principles and their goals, and it was great. And they said, this is what we want to do, but we have no idea how we're going to get there. And, um, and so that's what our panel was really charged with, with, with helping them figure out, and I'm overstating it quite a bit. You don't get to this without having a pretty good idea of all of the things that you need to solve it. And this is where our, our team landed. Um, uh, better coordination of uh, land use and housing planning. That includes, again, densifying in the places in the city where it's most appropriate, but doing it in a way that is appropriate for that neighborhood and that location. Um, maintaining the things that are drawing people to Boise and that Boise loves about itself. Um, uh, being very careful, particularly in those transition areas between higher density and lower density locations so that you're very conscientious about what you're designing and doing. And creating a balance between design review and public input and needing to move the development process forward. Um, they looked at the whole affordable housing toolbox, things that could be added, things that could be expanded. Um, again, density bonuses are a big uh, part of that fee and permit uh, waivers to reduce costs, having a city ombudsman to kind of identify ways to streamline the process and help some of the uh, developers through that process, particularly newer developers who are interested in working there, fast track permitting, um, uh, eliminating, elimination or reduction of some of the site development standards if those units were going to target uh, deep affordability, so serving some of the lowest income households. And, um, and again, looking at some of the financing tools that were available but not being leveraged, they were talking particularly about the 4% uh, low-income housing tax credit. On the education side, just as in DC, this was a big part of the panel's recommendations. It was a huge part of what the panel found in Boise. There's a public education piece, just a basic misunderstanding or lack of understanding around what housing needs are and the realities of housing development are. And so providing as much uh, community engagement and information as you can, and again, uh, accepting community input all along the way keeping partners informed, having a collective impact model so everybody can feel like they're, they're, they're part of something together and understand uh, kind of where everyone is moving together but also understanding individual opportunities that might be of value. Um, uh, for developers, building the capacity, particularly of local nonprofit developers and smaller developers who are interested in developing uh, lower cost units and expanding partnerships between local development, uh, developers and nonprofits. And then elected officials, that's always a hard nut to crack because you have uh, a change, a constant change of elected officials, but having them informed about, um, about, again, the housing needs that exist and the development processes that exist and the realities of development that exist that, that uh, make it difficult to meet those needs is critical. Uh, one of the things we really are trying to do with these panels is put together immediate recommendations, kind of medium-term recommendations, and then ongoing and long-term recommendations, and that's what you see here was kind of how the panel broke those down uh, for the city, the kind of Monday morning, first things that you can do when you get back in the office is look at extending affordability. Uh, periods, doing some outreach on the rent restricted units, some other pieces like that that could be done internally. The longer term items include um, policy development and longer term market development uh, opportunities as well. But I think it's really important to be clear about action steps that can be taken now and lay the foundation for future steps um, so that you can really track progress all along the way. And finally, this is just uh, one example of what we're doing uh, at ULI right now in terms of these study panels. We intend to do uh, a pace of about one a month for the next five years. We think that that will uh, give us a deep dive in a lot of cities. We hope that the particular focus of the studies that will immediately in a year or two be showing some impact on access and attainability. But we hope that as part of the process of doing these study panels, we're also giving cities a broader understanding of what the challenges they face and what the opportunities they have and options they have for meeting those challenges. So over a longer three to five year period, maybe the whole city is on a better path to uh, providing the housing that it needs. And then we're gonna collect all these and we're gonna create a better access point for this work. And we want anyone to be able to go online, look at these uh, reports and projects that we've done at different cities, look at the recommendations we've made around challenges so that they can take those learnings and apply them in their own locations. We have an enormous housing challenge that we have to meet in this country. I know that you know about it uh, personally here in Steamboat and some of the challenges that, uh, that you're facing. I hope the rest of the, uh, the country can take a page out of, out of your handbook 
book, your playbook here, because I think I, I see a, a lot more commitment and interest in the issue at a point where you can have an impact than I do in a lot of other areas of the country. So congratulations for that. Thanks for bringing me here today to be a part of this conversation. It's really great to be with you. And uh, I look forward to continuing our conversation in the Q&A. Great, so I'm taking a look at the questions that are posed on the social Q&A, and if you haven't had a chance to pose a question yet, I'll be looking at it while our speaker is responding to the questions. But the, the question, the hot question that's gotten the most votes so far is this. Are housing problems in a mountain town at all comparable to housing issues in a large city? Absolutely, and um, I think, uh, Frankly, no, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter where you are, there's a production and an undersupply problem. If it's not an overall supply problem, there is a supply problem with specific segments of the population, particularly as you get to the lower income end. And that's true no, no, no matter where you are. Um, and I think the set of solutions that you end up having to apply tend to be common in, uh, in resort towns, whether they be mountain towns or beach towns or, or whatever, um, with, uh, with a, a lot of the cities. Now, these pieces fit together differently depending on where you are. And definitely um, in resort areas where you have seasonal employees that need to be housed versus year-round employees that need to be housed, there's some different dynamics that you have to think about as you're designing that, that package of solutions. But um, you really have the same cost drivers involved. You have, a, you have an underlying production problem. You have an imbalance of supply and demand. You have the same cost drivers that are involved no matter where you're building those hard costs, soft costs, land costs break down in similar kinds of way. And the tools that you have to get at, at that are similar kinds of tools, though again, you may have to fit them together in a slightly different way to meet your, your unique local circumstances. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's nothing unique about what resort communities are, are facing, but it's not uh, kind of completely unrelated to uh, what other cities are facing as well. And frankly, we're hearing from uh, resort towns and we're also hearing from larger cities, Nashville is one that we've heard some recent from recently, um, that aren't completely uh, a, a tourist or resort location, but have a substantial tourist element that's impacting their, uh, their local home attainability. And they have very, very similar problems in a town the size of Nashville with maybe two million people in the metropolitan area as a small mountain town or, or a smaller beach community might have. So again, everything fits together in a little bit different way at the end of the day, what's politically viable, um, um, what makes the most sense based on the kind of history of the location and what the people's desires are is a little bit different, but um, the basic challenges and tools are the same. Are the same. Thank you. So what would be a tipping point for the public to really get behind a major housing solution nationwide? Meaning, what does the future really look like if we don't or can't fix this issue? Or, or what's the tipping point? I mean, what does it look like if we go the uh, we, bad We route? haven't found the tipping point where people are really... And, and frankly, I don't know that there is a national tipping point. I think it's really a local tipping point. Housing is, is, is very much driven um, and determined by local decision making. Certainly it would help if there were additional federal resources that could come in and uh, particularly help build housing that's affordable to lower income uh, uh, populations. But it, it's, primary, it's primarily at the local level where, um, where those determinations get made. And we are seeing some locations re reach a tipping point. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is kind of, in some locations, it was what I referenced, is you have to start losing some of your big businesses and a lot of your higher income residents to other areas um, uh, or some places have before they've started realizing that they better address this housing problem. So I think for some, pl some, some, pl some places have to go as far as having that spillover economic effect um, that's uh, more damaging economically to the location than they ever could have expected housing would be. I, I suspect most places can reach it uh, a little more quickly than that just because you know more and more people who are impacted. Or maybe your kids can't move back to where they grew up because they can't afford a place 
to live there, or maybe um, uh, the kids have moved out of the house and you want to move into a, a, a smaller unit somewhere, but there's so much competition for those, uh, those smaller units and the prices are so high that it's not a good option. So I think uh, some of those kind of personal concerns a lot of times will play into reaching a tipping point, um, but I think unfortunately a lot of times it takes a, a bigger problem or a bigger controversy to really drive it home. And I think it is being reflected, I think, more than ever before, mayors are talking about this in their speeches. More than ever before, you're seeing it on city council uh, agendas. Housing has not been a sexy issue that people run for office on in, in very many places over time. And now there aren't very many places in this country where they're not talking about it. So um, maybe we're getting to that tipping point. I don't know exactly uh, where it is. I think, uh, you know, considering the really desperate challenges that some of our, our, our families and individuals in this country are facing and the chunk that uh, covering a basic need is taking out of their family budgets, um, you would hope that we would reach the, the tipping point a little more quickly. Um, we, we have a responsibility to address this problem. It's the only way that our families and our cities can thrive. I love that. I love the way you answered that. That had a really complete feel to it. And I just really appreciate that we were standing in back and you said, you know, it used to be I couldn't get anyone to talk about housing, <laughs> and now it's a hot button topic. I'm like, where's your bodyguard? Um, so that was, thank you for that. Um, okay, there's a question here that's uh, getting a lot of votes. Talk to us a little about the mortgage interest mortgage interest tax deduction. Mm. What role does this subsidy play in steering federal subsidies toward more affluent households? It plays an awful role. It has a terrible history. I feel very comfortable in saying that, knowing that Ron Terwilliger, who donated the money to ULI to start this center, has been on a rampage against the mortgage interest deduction for decades um, because it is subsidizing uh, the wrong people. It doesn't mean that it never, that it didn't have a good function by its design and that it doesn't have some good impact. But at the end of the day, there are only so many federal dollars that can go toward housing on the direct spending side or the revenue side. And forever, the mortgage interest deduction has taken the bulk of those revenues. And it's gone to higher income, uh, it's gone to higher income households, it's gone to predominantly white households, it's gone to wealth building for a lot of people and that's provided value but we can't deny the opportunity costs. And a lot of the problem that we're seeing on the lower income side is that we haven't used uh, the same level of federal investment to address those needs. So uh, let's provide sufficient funding to meet those lower income needs. I'm not against a uh, mortgage interest deduction. I'm a homeowner, I, I, I like these, these, these kinds of things. They, and, and again, they do produce some positive effects and, and, and benefits but I think we have to make a cost-benefit analysis at the end, of the end of the day, and we have to remember the opportunity costs of those choices that we've made over decades, and it's the problems that I talked about. It's the challenges that people at the bottom end are facing and the inability to address the equity problems that have been created over, over more than 100 years. Great. I, um, so we're going to expand the viewpoint a little bit here. Um, how does the percentage of owned homes compared to rentals differ in the US and other developed countries. Now hold space for that. Hold space for that one. Because I, you know, that's asking you to bring a more international look at it. And I don't know if you can link this, but the high schools and high school students in the crowd have an international question as well. So I don't know if you can connect these. Is Barcelona's <laughs> recent success in creating dense super blocks neighborhoods a feasible option? to smart city growth in the U.S. as well. I need whoever asked that question to come teach me some lessons about what's happening in Barcelona. I think they I maybe have... are in an AP class. <laughs> and a... Okay. I am sure that that is a great question and I have no idea how to answer it. I have. <laughs> I really, I, I, I focus almost exclusively on the U.S. I've done a little bit of work um, looking at some housing challenges in, in Canada and a little bit of work um, looking at housing in Hong Kong and Singapore, but I am in no position um, really to answer either one of those questions. I think that there's a lot that goes into it, what the ownership and rental systems are in, in different countries, and they vary radically. Um, uh, I know enough to know that, and um, uh, I don't know what the, what the ownership rates are, but I think 
really in order to make a really meaningful comparison, that's a much broader question than just the ownership and rental rates. There's whole economic systems that are behind why these choices are made. And it's a, it, it is an interesting question that I am. Perfect. Not let me, let me shrink the, I love, no, I love that. Let me shrink the lens for you. Is there anything you want to say about owning a home versus renting a home? I know sometimes there's stigmas attached to being a renter. You know, there's so much attached to the American dream and you own a home as a way to generate wealth. So can you sort of talk about, kind of riff on home ownership versus being a renter in the United States? Absolutely, and I, I, I think they're both, they're, they're both important, and they both provide important opportunities and choices. And I think the main thing is that, that people need to have choices um, in, in their lives, and they need to be able to make different choices at different times in their lives. And, and you're not going to necessarily be a renter your whole life or a homeowner your, your whole life. The best situation of all would be an opportunity where you can move in and out of rental and ownership as that's appropriate for where you are in your life and what your, needs, what your broader needs are. Uh, in your life. I do think it was a, it, it, it's a mistake to think about home ownership as the only kind of wealth building tool um, and not thinking about other ways to build wealth. I also think it's, it's um, I like the way, uh, the new ways of thinking about ownership that have happened. And there's, uh, there's what's, uh, what they call a neighborhood REIT um, in California, it's called NICO. And um, they allow residents of the neighborhood to buy into this REIT that owns a lot of the housing. So you can be a renter in the neighborhood and own some of the multifamily housing that exists in the neighborhood at a much lower cost than if you were trying to buy your own home in the neighborhood. So there are actually ways to give people at lower income level the ability mm -hmm. to invest in their neighborhood, invest in the housing in their neighborhood without actually having uh, to be an owner. And I don't think that, uh, I think it's unfortunate that there's stigma attached, um, uh, attached to renters because I think particularly in the millennial cohort, um, um, even though we've seen a huge shift toward home ownership in, uh, in that age range over the last couple of years, the other thing that we've seen is this enormous move toward build to rent and some of the lower density rental development that's happened. And it's not just because it's really expensive to own. It's because a lot of these, uh, um, uh, a lot of these millennium, uh, uh, millennial uh, age uh, cohort have lived in highly amenitized apartments and um, they want something that looks more like home ownership, but they actually don't want to leave behind all of those amenities that they've enjoyed and the, the low maintenance uh, 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 responsibilities that they've enjoyed for that. So I think there is a, uh, uh, a I think people are choosing to rent more than they may have in the past when they actually, um, well, until the last year or two when we've seen the run-up in housing prices, they may have been able to choose. It's harder today to choose to become a homeowner. But, um, but I do think that there is a, a, a lot more preference toward uh, rental than you may have seen in the past. And I think it's unfortunate that there's a stigma there because it really is, for many people, the most appropriate housing choice to make. And um, uh, that shouldn't be held uh, against them for any reason. They can be a, a, a perfectly strong contributing member of that community uh, just as much when they're renting their home as when they're, when they're purchasing it. Okay, so we're gonna, let's, let's take a mythical millennial and put them on the stage. And they've, they've gotten confident about the amount of money they have, enough to enter the home owning market in their area. Maybe they've learned enough skills get skills around home ownership from their landlord um, that they feel like they can take that on. I'm going to actually go with the direct wording that was posted by a member of the audience who said, how much avocado toast does a millennial have to skip in order to afford a house in today's market? And it goes a little bit further. In all seriousness, what advice do you give to that mythical millennial who's trying to buy their first home? It's it's hard, and and frankly, um, with the prices where they are where they are right now, it takes um, uh, it takes a lot of support from family and non bank opportunities or other. You have to look for other ways to get there because the cost is so high. And, um, and I, I mean, I really don't think I have great solutions. <laughs> yeah. Save money, take care of your credit. <laughs> you know, the, those kinds of, of uh, basic things that, that everybody kind of needs to do to take care of their financial health and to prepare themselves, whatever their uh, kind of future that they're trying to plan for, the things that you need to do. But as long as housing is as expensive as it is, it's, you're going to have to give up a heck of a lot of avocado toast um, b b before you're... <laughs> 
before you're going to get there. And one of the things we do look at in our home attainability index is how long it takes some of these occupations to save money for a down payment. And, and, uh, and you factor in what they're, having to, what they're having to pay in rent and, so, and what their other expenses would be and then what they ideally might have left behind to save. And I mean, you're looking at 15, 17, 21, 30 years to save enough money for a down payment. And, and uh, I mean, that's a heck of a lot of avocado toast. Um, and uh, so I think, um, I don't know that I have a lot of help for, uh, for a millennial who's looking for a home today. Jump in in your local YIMBY organization and help us get housing built so that the people coming up behind you who are going to have some uh, stock that they can afford and won't be in as difficult a situation as you are um, because uh, uh, the, the restriction in supply is, is, is serving a tiny uh, portion of our population at, at the end of the day. And uh, those challenges that you're facing, millennials are going to keep passing down to the, to the folks behind you unless we take some steps to address it. You've got me thinking that this millennial needs to work on their elevator pitch for the next Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> okay, here's another question, because if we back it up a little bit, um, the question before that was, you brought California in, and um, there's a question that brings in some of the things they're doing differently. What do you think about California's new law allowing homeowners to build ADUs? Now, I wasn't familiar with that term before, but accessory Accessory dwelling units. Accessory dwelling units, accessory apartments, granny flats. They call it, there's all kinds of different names that they've been called okay. in different geographies. They call them different things. But essentially, it's a very small unit. It can be, it can be under the same roof. So sometimes they call them accessory apartments. Okay. Um, and so sometimes it's kind of putting a kitchen into a basement um, um, so that you can have an additional unit there. Sometimes it's a small unit that's built into a garage or even a, 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 a small unit built a freestanding unit that's built into a, into a backyard, and it's a great tool. It's a great tool because, you know, it's one thing to say that every neighborhood needs to be a part of the solution, but you know, there's single-family neighborhoods where you're never even going to get a four-unit apartment building built, um, and, um, and, and frankly, there would be legitimate concerns if you looked across the neighborhood and there's one kind of four-unit apartment building that looks nothing like all the single-family homes in that neighborhood. ADUs are a way to enable you know, substantially increased density in that neighborhood without altering the uh, architectural character without altering the look and feel, kind of preserving that, but also recognizing that there's a, there's a, a broader need that could be met by adding those units. Now, allowing them, legalizing ADUs is a long-term solution. Places where they've done it, it's actually taken some investment in helping people figure out how to do it um, uh, to actually get those units moving and on the ground. But um, in the cities that have put a little bit of investment in that and to helping bring people through the system and in some places even providing a little bit of subsidy to help get some of the work done, uh, we are starting to, to see some impact. And, um, and it, it's a way in like that, that Rock Creek West planning area in Washington, D.C., where it's almost all single-family homes. It's, it's a way that you can put over 1,000 units easily in Rock Creek West if you enabled ADUs and you provided um, some guidance and incentives to, to get them, uh, to get them uh, built. Great. So it's, are you seeing any downsides to that new not legislation? Not really. I mean, okay. I haven't. I guess that, you know, that's not downsides so much as it kind of, you know, some communities where they've, where they've been put in, they haven't had the impact mm -hmm. that they wanted. But I mean, that's primarily a result of the broader housing shortage, which then incentivizes using those units for short-term rentals and other kinds of okay. things that don't address the longer, the longer term need. Um, so they've maybe not been maximized everywhere mm -hmm. that they've been done, but I haven't seen major, major problems caused um, by putting those units in. Okay. So am I correct? You're currently part of a campaign of the Urban Land Institute's entitled Attainable Housing for All. Correct. Who needs to take the lead on this? Nonprofit, for-profit, government, someone else? It depends on where you are. Whoever, whoever has the most influence needs to take the lead. <laughs> whoever can get people to fall in line behind them. Um, you, you need to have the, I mean, I think everyone needs to be a part of the conversation and it, uh, and it really does kind of matter where you are on who the right person or what the right organization is 
to really lead that effort. You obviously have to have a commitment from local government and you have to have public officials who are taking it extremely seriously. You have to have a development community that's interested in solving the problems and interested in having deep conversations about planning and about policy and have some give and take and to be very serious about public input. I think making sure that um, organizations out there on both sides advocate for development or against development, they need to have the ability to be a part of the process and be heard and to have their concerns mitigated or at least understood in a serious way so they don't leave the process feeling like that they, uh, they haven't been heard. I think everybody's gotta be a part of it. It's a, such a huge challenge that, uh, and, and we see how easy it is to throw these developments off course. Uh, you know, if you get one kind of interest group involved or stakeholder involved in the process who gets unhappy, you can throw the whole project off course. And, um, and so uh, uh, creating a process so that everyone can be involved and then getting the folks in charge of it who are respected, who are influential, and who can push it forward is important. But I wouldn't pretend to know who those are uh, here in Steamboat or in any other uh, particular location because it, it, it does really kind of, uh, uh, it changes depending on, on where you are. I can appreciate that was that you brought to us that definition, the two-part definition of dysfunctional. So you're looking to at least mitigate the second part, really get all the stakeholders working together. This is a niche question from the audience, but I thought it was interesting. Can you talk to tiny homes? Tiny um, homes. Um, rurally, nationally. I think, uh, Again, I, I think every tool in the toolbox is important, and I think we've seen some places where tiny homes have created some great impact um, for people. Uh, uh, and I, there are two particular spaces that I, I would mention. One, I would mention, um, because we gave an award to the Aspen Ski Company for a tiny home community that it built a few years back to accommodate some of its seasonal um, ski instructors and other, and, and other ski staff there. Um, they were able to do that at a cost that makes sense, that can really serve an example for um, other businesses that need to provide similar kinds of, of housing. And it's something that uh, it's been successful from their employee standpoint as well, and that's something I always wonder about with the tiny houses is, you know, it's one thing if you're choosing to live there, but if it's chosen for you, I don't know uh, how well that would work, but from all indications, um, it's been very well received, and part of that is because there aren't any other options, I guess, if you're, if you're are there a few other options if you're um, uh, trying to work as a ski instructor in, in, in Aspen? Um, so I think it is an option that businesses in some kind of resort areas can use and leverage uh, in a way that can be helpful. The other place that's really shown some impact in a variety of places around the country is in the veteran community. And um, they've been able to take relatively small pieces of land, provide opportunities for veterans to own their own tiny home, but to live together collectively on a piece of land and uh, have a mutual understanding and support and community there. And um, I don't know how widespread it is, but I know that it's been a very effective tool in a few locations and if there's somebody we certainly uh, are a group of people who we certainly should be make, making sure they have access to decent housing they can afford it's our it's our veterans and those who have served and who put themselves in harm's way for the things that many that the rest of us enjoy so um, it's a good tool it's not something that I would say is for everyone or even for for for, for most folks but for people um, for certain organizations it's a great a, a great tool for seasonal staff and for certain target populations it's been a really a uh, great tool to add housing stock in a quick way and in a way that they can build a supportive community around. Well, I want you to know there's more questions from our audience tonight, but our time is winding down, so I'm going to leave it to one last question, but I do want to thank the audience for the questions for tonight, and those of you who are joining us at the dinner afterwards, um, there'll be questions time there as well. But I'm going to have the last question for tonight be the one. When we were backstage, I asked Christopher, What's the question that you, that no one asks you and you kind of wish they did? <laughs> and so I'm going to turn that question back on you. What do you think is the role, what, what role should evil developers play and what role do they play in driving the cost of housing? We were laughing about some of the background of developments in his organization. Working for evil developers, uh, uh, by and large, who are members of my organization, um, uh, I, I actually think I've, I've learned a lot about the development industry um, since I've been here. I think uh, the namesake of the, the center um, is a great example of the good that many developers are out there trying to do. Ron Terwilliger 
built a lot of apartments around this country over the course of a career, and what he learned from that was that more investment needed to be made to get housing to the people who couldn't afford the apartments that he was building, and he spent his post official career, although he's still developing housing, um, really focusing on making investments in ULI and other organizations that are trying to enable this broader housing challenge to be met. So first of all, uh, evil developer may not be as fair a charge as, um, as it's often so loosely made. The other things about the development process that I didn't always understand, um, um, one is it's really not the developer's profit that's driving the cost of these prof uh, projects. At the end of the day, it's the cost of capital. And um, you have to provide a return to equity investors who are coming forward, and you have to provide them that return before the developer gets any return. And on the debt side, it's interesting because in order uh, to get a loan for a lot of these residential developments, uh, the developer has to put their personal assets on the line. You don't have to do that in a lot of businesses in the United States. And if you don't understand that piece of it, it's easy to kind of point at a developer who's built a lot of housing in a lot of communities and made some money doing it and say, you know, this is, I know where the cost is coming from for, for this stuff. Um, but the risk that is being undertaken is something that's not often seen. And the reality is that, that um, uh, in these developments, everyone's getting paid first. Um, and so often the developer is much more, has much more of an ability to control the cost than to drive the cost, and that's what their goal is, to make those projects pencil out, to make these projects viable, to get units on the ground. And, um, and so that's, that's, that's what they're gonna, that's what they're gonna work to do. And I think there are many, many, the great thing that I've experienced at ULI is our members want, have a dream of transforming communities in ways that they haven't necessarily been to able to achieve through their own work, but they feel like collectively working together and bringing their expertise together to address some of their challenges, they can have a bigger impact. And they're investing things like in things like the Terwilliger Center where we're going around the country and trying to make housing more affordable, trying to enable developers to build housing and deliver it at lower rents and at lower, and at lower prices. And there are many, many, many developers who are out there trying to do this. And um, so um, don't blame your, your friendly developer. And I'm not saying everyone is good. They're bad apples in every, uh, in every industry. Um, but I think more often than not, Developers want to be a part of the solution. They do see opportunities in, uh, in the housing industry because there is so much need and there is so much undersupply out there. Um, but I think there's great alignment right now with what a de developers want to accomplish in their work and what cities need to accomplish in order for them and for their residents to thrive in the future. So I think we ought to take advantage of that alignment and have cities in uh, the development community working more closely together and addressing these problems that we know that we have but that we also know that the solutions exist. So um, let's work together, uh, everybody, and, um, and see what we can do to, uh, to address housing challenges in our resort communities and mountain areas and our beach areas and our larger cities uh, everywhere uh, in this country where we're, we're seeing attainability and access be a challenge, which is everywhere. Well, I'm just so grateful that um there are people out there whose jobs are to, and missions are to keep the housing dream alive and face the dysfunction with your own function. And um, it's so wonderful that you made the trip all the way to this little place in Steamboat Springs. And I just thank you for that. So Thanks very thank much. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.